Hello, everybody. Um, it's awesome to be back. It's my first time back in the UK for three years, so i um, so happy to be back. Um, drink all the delicious beer and all of those other things. All right, cool. So we're talking about fishing, um, and I don't mean the sport of which I have no knowledge. Um, talking about fishing-resistant MFA. So clicker. there we go. Thank you. Um, so apparently I need no introduction, but here's one anyway. Um, my name's Graham. I'm a senior tech lead manager at Airbnb on the client engineering team. I am one of the co-founders of London Apple Admins. I am on the board of Mac Admins Open Source, and I am also a Movember fundraiser. Um, to date, we've raised nearly $40,000 um, thanks to the generosity of this community. You know, it was five years ago at this very conference that I kicked off my campaign. So if any of you find this talk useful in any way, and if you don't, you can donate anyway, um, please. <laughs> Uh, so today we're talking about Airbnb's journey to phishing-resistant MFA. Um, so, sorry, it has nothing to do with Max at all. So before we start, let's go over a couple of pieces of terminology that I'm going to be using today. So first off, MFA, multi-factor authentication. So the goal is to stop someone getting access to your stuff using only username and password. Um, consists of something you know, your username and password, and something you physically have. Might be a phone, might be a security key, might be one of those number generator keychain thingies. And I, so fun fact, I, I thought they didn't exist at work anymore, but I got a Slack message this morning saying, we just found several hundred of these in the closet. What should we do? And I was like, burn them. Um, <laughs> get rid of them, please. Um, or it's something that's unique to you. Uh, biometrics, face ID, fingerprint, retina scan, that kind of stuff. So phishing. Phishing is a kind of social engineering attack that's often used to steal user data like login credentials, credit card numbers, that kind of stuff. It occurs when an attacker masquerading as a trusted entity dupes the victim into opening an email, an instant message, text message, or some sort of other notification. And finally, we've got IDP, your identity provider. It's your source of truth for user's identity. Uh, it could be Okta, OneLogin, Ping, or any of those. There's thousands of these things, and they're all pretty much the same. So our story begins in 2016. Um, this is when I started working at Airbnb, and we were at the same MFA level as most companies were seven years ago. Um, we had an IDP, and we enforced some sort of MFA on it. Um, we didn't really have any restrictions on what MFA you could use. You could use anything you wanted, really, including SMS and phone calls, um, which was the first thing we turned off. Um, so we looked at the logs, and we found that really no one was using it. There's a few people. Um, but the vast majority of them were using it from a smartphone, so they could install the MFA providers app and use push notifications. So it was actually pretty straightforward to walk them through turning off this terrible form of MFA. Um, so why did we rush to turn this off? Why is this not a particularly good idea to use this? Um, and hopefully my bank is watching this, because that's all they offer. Um, because SMS is not encrypted. Um, so if the cellular infrastructure gets compromised, it's absolutely trivial to get hold of your text messages. So that might happen to you. But more likely is you'll be a victim either SIM cloning or SIM swapping. So SIM cloning is the process of copying over the IMSI, and I definitely didn't just read that acronym off, um, and the authentication key to another SIM card. So this allows a bad actor access to your incoming calls and messages. Um, these days, this requires physical access to the SIM card, so not very likely to happen. Um, but something that is much more likely to happen is SIM swapping. Um, it's an account takeover attack. So a bad actor convinces your phone provider to port your number to another SIM card. It's really common, and there is absolutely nothing you can do to stop it. Um, it's entirely down to your phone provider performing adequate identity verification. They might, they might not, who knows? Um, so that's the primary reason you should consider phone and SMS MFA insecure. So it's in 2016 that we started issuing YubiKeys to our engineers to store their SSH key on. Um, so this had the byproduct of kickstarting the usage of security keys at Airbnb. So then we get to 2017. Um, we started introducing Chrome OS, our third-party contact centers. Um, 
And these users were only ever allowed to use security keys. We didn't let, ever let them use anything else. Um, however, due to a limitation of our MFA provider at the time, uh, with the Chrome OS login screen, um, we had to use U2F, which even then was a legacy protocol for security keys. So things just sort of trundled along for a few years at that point. Um, we had corporate users using the MFA vendors app with push notifications and a security key if they had one. Um, in late 2017, we started shipping a security key to everyone who got a new laptop, um, uh, plugged one in as we sent it out, uh, not just engineering. But we didn't enforce their use for MFA. Um, we encouraged people to do it when they were onboarded, but that's kind of it. So things just carried on towards 21. And we've been thinking about moving to only using security keys for a while. But our hand was kind of forced into it in 2021. So if you recall, I said that we set up all of our security keys, our contact center partners, using U2F. In 2021, Google announced through a blog post, and not contacting their customers, which was helpful, um, that they were removing U2F from Chrome. At this point, we probably had like 15 to 20,000 Chrome OS devices. Um, that's quite a lot. And at the time, our MFA provider didn't have a migration path from U2F to WebAuthn. So the user needed to re-enroll their key into the tool again. So we had 20,000 people <laughs> that needed to take an action to re-enroll their key, um, this manual process. And we're like, great. Um, so if they're re-enrolling their keys, we might as well make a change for the future. So we really like the security key flow in Google. Um, in addition to when your session expires and you have to re-authenticate and use your security key, um, it also keeps an eye out for suspicious logins. So it's like when you come from a device you don't usually use or a different location or something like that. Um, so that allowed us to have much longer session lengths than we would have been able to in our previous tool. Also around that time, our IDP introduced support for something called trusted IDP. So this is when you use the SAML assertion from one identity provider to authenticate a second. It'll make time in a second, trust me. Um, so in our case, it meant that we could set up our original IDP as a SAML app in Google, and then use that to authenticate each application in our IDP. Because I don't know about your IDP, but ours has hundreds of apps in, and they're all unique snowflakes. Um, they're all set up by hands, because all vendors are different. It, moving off your IDP is tough. So this allowed us to stay on our original IDP and take advantage of Google's security features. So before we go any further, we need to talk about WebAuthn. So unlike its predecessor, U2F, WebAuthn is an open standard and supports in all major browsers. The WebAuthn API allows servers to register and authenticate users, and the authenticator can be a variety of things. It could be internal to the computer using a TPM or a secure enclave. Um, you could be using an external security key, such as those made by Yubico or Facian. Or it could be a pass key, as long as you don't want to use managed app IDs. Um, sad times. So let's have a look at how WebAuthn actually works. When you want to register a new credential, which could either be used as a second factor alongside the username and password, or as your primary factor in a passwordless login, the authenticator generates a public and private key. Uh, the private key, in most cases, uh, generates on dedicated hardware, like hardware. In our case, it's a YubiKey. The authenticator sends along the public key to the server it's registering with, and the domain name that the credentials generated for is also stored on the authenticator. So this means that that key pair will only ever be used for that site. Um, and we also know that the authenticator is physically present on the device that's authenticating to the server, which eliminates a big phishing attack surface. So when you want to sign in with your credential, the server is going to send you a piece of random data. Your authenticator then signs that data with your private key and sends it back to the server to be verified. So an important thing to note here is that you need to physically authorize the use of your private key. Uh, this is often touching a button on your security key or using biometrics like Face ID. This ensures that someone's physically present, so malware shouldn't be able to authorize the use of your private key. Say so shouldn't. So our migration, we split up into various phases. Our first group to move on to the new Authflow were our third-party contact center partners. We chose them 
because they only use a really small number of applications. I mean, they're, they work, they're in a call center taking calls from our customers. Uh, most of those apps are written in-house, which means that they should already support modern authentication standards. And if they didn't, we have the ability to change them. This group of users is using cr exclusively Chrome OS. Um, we do that for security reasons. But it also has the side benefit of they're just using a web browser. Um, they might be using one or two allow listed Android apps. Uh, and this group of users has been using security keys with U2F for many years, um, which means they used to the workflow of using security keys. They already have supply chains established for getting keys. And we didn't know security keys needed to be shipped to people. So we could move really quickly on this. And finally, this group of users has access to our most sensitive data. That's our customer data. So once we decided who was going to get moved over first, we could get stuck into planning this thing out. So this is obviously a really disruptive change. Um, we need help from all over the business, uh, from our liaisons, our CS partners, our own IT support folks, uh, the people in charge of change management. This is the name of a few of the teams we had to work with. So when you're trying to sell a disruptive change to your business, or organization, sorry, um, there are four key pieces of information you need to give to your stakeholders. What's happening? You, know, you need to be really clear here. Avoid tech jargon. Um, explain what your end user are actually going to have to do. Like, that's the, really, that's the main thing they care about. What have I got to do here? Why is it happening? Once again, avoid tech jargon. You're speaking to real people here, not nerds. Um, you could outline the benefits if it's an unforced change. Um, but in our case, it was simply that Google are sunsetting the method in which we use security keys. What will happen if we don't do this? Right. Outline the risks associated with doing nothing. For us, it was when Google releases Chrome 98, knowing our contact center is going to be able to log into their device. That's, that's pretty bad. So when is it happening? Be as accurate as you can with your timeline. Um, set a deadline when this stuff has to be done. But build some slack into it. There will always be stragglers. There will be people who, for some reason, have left it to the last minute. They think it didn't apply to them. Um, and these people are always the one who find the issue, obviously. So whatever, just make sure you give us enough chance to get everything done. So getting the communication lines open early on the project was critical for us. Um, when we first kicked this off, we didn't have a clear timeline. Um, because we didn't know when, exactly when Chrome 98 was going to be released. Um, but even if your timeline's unclear, you can begin talking to your stakeholders and get this onto their radar, because you're going to need help. All right, so that's the who. Now, how? how? How are we going to do this? So our plan was to use the presence of a security key on the user's Google account, plus whether we put them into this eligible Google group, to make the switch from using our actual IDP to using Google for their primary authentication, setting our IDP to trust Google SAML assertion for that user, and disabling the MFA prompt from our MFA provider. That's really easy, right? Knock that on the weekend? No problem, right? Yeah, not really. Um, unfortunately, there were lots of things we had to consider, like how do we handle rolling back if we needed to? Um, this could have gone really badly. Um, fortunately, it didn't, but it could have. How do we handle exceptions if someone has this strange app that they need more time to migrate over to one MFA? So in the end, this was the diagram for our migration tool. I'm not going to go over it. Um, but you can see it was quite detailed. Um, we had quite a few challenges when we were developing this solution. Um, some vendors API documentation was wrong, just like 100% wrong, uh, full of lies. Uh, some vendors APIs were much slower than we really expect them to. Um, we also hit scaling limits, so we end up having to split this thing out into microservices so we could scale horizontally. So obviously, we're not going to yolo this out across our entire contact center support user base. Um, that would have been pretty reckless. So we chose a CS partner we'd worked with before um, to test changes. We know we have a good relationship with them. They have good people in IT who can articulate issues quickly and accurately. Um, and for us, a benefit for us is they're also in Europe, um, which means we can test at the end of their shift. We don't cause them too much disruption. Uh, the time difference also means that we have time to roll up changes if we really mess stuff up um, before they start work the next day. And it also gives us a chance to work on any issues during our working day on the west coast of the US so we can get them testing again the next day. 
So we created a Slack channel to make sure all of the stakeholders on both our side and the partner side, uh, such as their IT folks, the team leads who are going to be talking directly with the, the contact center agents, were all invited into this channel. We made sure that all the comms around testing stayed in the channel. And that is harder than it sounds, because people really love email. Um, <laughs> So it's like making sure everyone's on the right, all the right people who manage the email threads um, and allow people to catch up on pe allow people to catch up on what's already happened when they come into the project. So during our test with this partner, uh, we found two main issues, and um, both of them were around our comms. Uh, as I mentioned before, some of the APIs we had to work with were really, really slow. I mean, it took like an hour and a half for the migration tool to complete a run. Um, our users were surprised when. They enrolled their key into Google, and nothing happened. So we need to let them know that. Um, we also had users who expected to need to re-authenticate immediately. I mean, they already had a Google session. We, we did consider invalidating it, but we didn't really see any need to. So we just need to let them know this was going to happen. So our testing was complete. We are ready to launch. Our main task at this point was getting the message in front of our users. The actual actions they need to take were really very simple. Um, we're fortunate to have great partners in our change management org. Uh, they sent repeated comments to our CS partners. They kept naughty lists of people who hadn't done anything up to date, um, and they, they really kept hammering the sites that weren't in compliance. They really helped us out. So we also had wallpapers localized into every major language that our agents spoke to remind them of what they had to do. Now, remember, this is a contact center. Like, we can flatten your wallpaper. It's OK. Um, I'm sure this isn't a method that most people would be able to take. Uh, so eventually, we need to enforce our new security posture. Um, we gave our partners six weeks to migrate. You're never going to get 100% compliance just by asking nicely. Um, so we closely monitored our enrollment numbers. Of course, despite the hard deadline, we couldn't just shut down our call centers, right? You know, if no one had did anything, we're, we're in trouble, because blocking out all of our CS agents is just is not going to happen. So when the time came, fortunately, we had about 95% compliance before the deadline. And we decided that was enough. So we then blocked access to tools the agents needed to use to do their job. Um, the inability to do their job really made them enroll quite quickly. Um, so that's it. Um, that's, that's all it was for the first 60% of people. Um, the next 40 were much more interesting. Um, so we still needed to get our employees and contractors using security keys. So let's have a look at our goal for the migration again. We wanted to eliminate fishable MFA from our environment. This means no push, no SMS, no one-time passcodes, no phone calls, none of that stuff. So let's have a look at a real-world example why you might want to do this. So you might recall last year, a large ride-sharing company, who I won't name, uh, was compromised. How did the attacker get in? Well, first off, a user's password is found on the dark web. So the attacker tried to log into this user's account which meant that a push notification was sent to the user's phone, which happened over and over and over again. And until this user was so fed up with all these pushes, they went, OK, then, accept. And that was it. Um, so the actual MFA happened in a totally different place to where the login was happening. Um, and as soon as the user accepted this push, the attacker was able to, load, to add in their own MFA device to the user's account. And they're in. That's it. So lots of other bad things happened once the bad actor got past the perimeter and can get into VPN. But the fact remains that push MFA is one of the primary reasons this company was compromised. So we planned on beginning our migration, the rest of the users, at the end of 2022. Like after, summer's our busiest time. We're a travel company. So after our summer peak was over, we were going to start migration. But the world changed a little bit in 2022. Um, world events made us want to kick this off a little bit quicker. So one of the biggest reasons that push is popular, because it's really, really convenient. Like, you know, most people have got a smartphone. It's nice and easy to push it. Um, and unfortunately, security keys are quite inconvenient. Um, we were, as I mentioned before, able to allay some of these fears by requiring users to MFA only every, every two weeks on managed devices in most cases and rely on Google's suspicious login detection. There was the very valid fear from our leadership of users not being able to work if they lose their security key. 
So we decided to give users two keys. Uh, one that lives in their laptop permanently. I know some people don't agree with that, but it's a risk versus usability thing that we accepted. And another that they could use as a backup on their laptop and for mobile NFA, MFA, sorry, using NFC. Um, these little blue things, actually, they're black, no, if you get anyone, but whatever. Um, we also got buy in to make sure there's zero friction to ordering security keys. Um, we decided there didn't need to be any approvals. Um, users would be able to log into a self service portal and order their own security key. So, once again, let's get some buy in for this really horribly disruptive change. Um, we're moving everyone for other, more easily fishable MFA to security keys. We are doing this because we have security concerns of our continuing use of push MFA. If we do not do this, we are concerned that we'll have a security breach, which could result in private information being compromised. So fortunately, after all this, they're sold. Um, so our migration code for CS partners could be reused for everyone else. Um, so there wasn't really much sort of tech work to do on this, but there were other logistical challenges. So first, one of our biggest challenges was to identify all of our application users could go for an SSO flow in. Um, obviously, web apps uh, that use a regular web browser are going to be fine. Chrome's OK with security keys. Um, but we had many native apps on both desktop and mobile that use ancient APIs that did not support security keys. Um, we had to push our vendors a lot on this uh, to get these updated. Uh, we had a few apps we identified to be potential deal breakers for migration. But we also found that quite a lot of these apps just needed like a tick box turned on in their back end to use a real web browser for authentication versus their crappy web view. Um, so remember to check with the vendor. It might just be a configuration change you need to make. And if they're kind of like, uh, about security keys, then remind them what you pay for. You're the customer. Other vendors are available if they don't support it. Um, so we needed a plan for getting security keys in our users' hands. Where are they going to be shipped from? How do users order one? How long will they take to get delivered to basically every country on Earth? Um, and finally, how are we going to enable this for our users? So we had high priority users that we need migrating as soon as humanly possible. Our execs and their direct reports are high risk users. Um, we didn't have a self service method to get them keys yet. Um, so our quite fantastic support folks worked with all these people to get them keys. Uh, they ordered them from Amazon for them sometimes. And in some cases, they literally hand delivered them their keys. They did a great job and they really helped us out. Um, so our next group of users to get on security keys were IT and InfoSec. Um, need to get them on early to catch any issues. Um, then we could start asking everyone else to start enrolling. We decided that we weren't going to prevent anyone from enrolling at any point. Um, you know, we have quite a few engineers, they're really techie people. They, some people really like all this stuff. Um, so if they hear about this stuff on the grapevine, we wanted them to go and get a key and get on and help us test early. So once this part of the project was rolling, we met twice weekly to ensure that everyone stayed aligned. And we had an awesome PM helping everyone move in the right direction. We identified our minimum product really early on. We decided which apps were critical to the business and would block the launch. And then those which we could live without. I mean, let's face it, a lot of mobile apps, they have exactly the same function as the web app. It was OK to say, OK, we're just going to ditch these. So the day finally came. We had the self-service portal uh, to order keys ready. Uh, the automation was churning away, moving people over to the new flow uh, when they enrolled their keys. And some people in IT even ordered and enrolled keys. But quite a lot didn't. Um, and we really needed these people to move on to new flow and test this stuff out to iron out any issues before we launched this to the whole company. Um, so this is where we made our first really big mistake. Um, we knew that we would need to enforce the use of security keys on our testers at some point. Um, and whilst we had buy-in on the project from our senior leaders, we hadn't solidified who's actually going to sign off on cutting off all this, this access to all these people. Um, fortunately, our leadership did really believe in the project. So our CIO, CIO posted in Slack a few times, encouraging people to enroll uh, with the all important why. And when it came to deadline day, uh, my director didn't hesitate to say, yep, block them. Um, that's not actually the words he used, but I won't repeat the language he used there, um, not for public consumption. Uh, so the moral of this story, 
is to identify those who can ratify the hard decisions early on and make sure you prep them about the decision they're going to have to make. So it came to time to actually enforce on our first group. And so once we knew that these, security keys had, uh, these laptops had a security key in them when we shipped them out, um, we didn't know if they'd been lost, eaten by the dog. God knows what they've done with them. Um, so how can we make sure? Uh, we have OS Query running all our endpoints. Uh, it streams data about them into centralized logging. So we could query each device and see which ones didn't have a security key plugged in. And we were able to add these people on these laptops to ex exemption groups uh, once they got another key ordered up from somewhere. And so we felt comfortable blocking access to some things like Jira for the people that hadn't enrolled. And then just like magic, when there was a tool that they needed to do their job, um, our enrollment numbers went up. Amazing. So apart from one application that we need to add a few people to an exemption group for, uh, whilst they really shouted at their vendor, uh, the rollout was going pretty smoothly. So let's have a look at what our users had to do. So I mentioned before that we decided to make it trivial for users to get a security key. This is the portal that we built. Um, you can tell that IT built it because it's not that pretty. Um, it integrates directly with our vendor's API, and they handle all the shipping and logistics for us. Uh, you can see that I've ordered one or two keys for science or something. Um, the important thing to take away here, though, isn't that you need to build out some web portal for self-service key ordering. Um, it's that you need to make it as frictionless as possible for your organization. Um, if you're serious about everyone always having access to a security key, uh, you need to remove all barriers to getting one, um, which includes approvals, um, budgets, cost. You need to work those things out. So obviously, someone has to pay for it, but you need to don't worry about those sort of things. Um, so in our tool, all they have to do is enter their, their address, and in a couple of days, a security key pops up in their, in their mailbox. So all in all, we shipped 11,000 security keys in 2022 to our employees and contractors across the globe. So at this point, our marketing plan is in full swing. Uh, we send out emails every week to people and enrolled. Uh, we have messages in the all company Slack channel. Uh, we're in the monthly company newsletter. Uh, we also got the chance to be featured uh, in the pre-roll for an all-hands meeting. Uh, so our media production team made a kind of a slightly tongue in You know those silly unboxing videos you see on YouTube? I don't understand them myself, but um, they seem to be popular. They made a spoof of one of those, which was quite funny, but unfortunately, I'm not allowed to show that. Um, so this is how things went for a few weeks. Uh, every week, we would email a new group and send reminders to those who'd already had their first email. Our numbers went up pretty, quick, pretty quickly. Um, we also started pinging the managers of people who hadn't migrated. Um, you know, it's in the manager's interest that their employees are still able to do their job. So you know, leverage all of, the le all of the tools you have here. So eventually, we got to our enforcement date. Uh, we'd learned from last time and got our execs to sign off on it beforehand. Um, and when we enforced, we got to 97% compliance. Um, when we blocked access to tools behind our identity aware proxy. Uh, this is the same enforcement method we use for our contact center partners. But you know, so I'm, I'm not saying 100% compliance here. Like, so there's a surprising number of people who didn't access any tools behind IAP. And I was genuinely quite surprised by this, but apparently they existed. Um, so in the end, we just forced migrated them over to Google Auth. Um, we started on the people who had rec most recently signed into their account, and then we moved them over, which effectively locked them out of their account. Um, they actually had to get in touch with our IT support folks. Um, to go through identity verification to get back into their account. Um, so because this was obviously quite disruptive on our IT support folks, uh, we performed this slowly over a few days because we knew that literally the only path these people would have to get back into their account was to call up someone and say help. Um, so we wanted to limit the load on them. So in the space of eight months, we migrated nearly 28,000 users who are located in practically every country on Earth. So once again, this would only be possible with complete buy-in from our leadership. So if you only take one thing away from this talk, is this. Getting buy-in not only gets you access to the resources you need, and it definitely takes a lot for a project like this. We had a total of five teams involved across InfoSec and IT. Um, somewhere close to 70 different people were involved in this migration. It was a huge effort, and it was a ton of work. But leadership buy-in also gets you the political clout to make the tough decisions you'll inevitably be blocking access to some portion of your users. How many are you allowed to block? 
How much backing are you going to get when you need to cut some people off? These are the things you get when you sell this to your leadership. So that's it. You can find me in these places. I have a rarely updated website. I very occasionally post a Mastodon. And you can email me at my very cryptic and hard to guess email address. And if you found this talk useful in any way, please consider donating to the Movember Foundation. And do I have time for questions? Yeah. Cool. Yes, if there's any questions? Anybody? Hands? Oh, Tom. You would be in the middle, wouldn't you? <laughs> I may have missed this, so I apologize if I'm asking a question that you covered. Moving to WebAuthn means support for platform authenticators, mm -hmm. like those found in our devices now. Yes. What was the choice that you made in terms of not supporting the native platform authenticator functionality and going to a security key? Um. We have a variety of platforms we support. Like our number one platform is Chrome OS. Um, and yeah, physical keys are logistically easier for us. Um, they're available all over the world. They're not dependent on which model of device, because we don't actually own the devices either. The Chrome OS devices, our partners own them. They buy them, we just manage them. So we have a short list of devices that we suggest, but we can't enforce what devices they use. And it meant that we would be able to get, we knew we were able to get WebAuthn everywhere, regardless of which device the person was using. Hello. Um, so one question I have is around how you went about the initial rollout. You mentioned that you had your C-suite be the first group outside of your uh, contractors, and then you moved on to IT and InfoSec. Yep. In projects I've run of a similar vein, I've always tried to target IT and InfoSec first to make sure that there are no sort of major showstoppers. What made it so that you chose your C-suite as the primary non-contractor audience? Um, political situation in the world and threat posed to those people. Um, that, I can't say any more than that. <laughs> I think it, it's all right. Can we take them offline, if that's okay, because we want to move on. So thank you very much, Graham. <laughs>